Good evening and welcome to our continuous revision. So tonight we are going to discuss uh, an aspect of law of thought that is a rule in Roland's lecture. Uh, but before that, uh, let me uh, just give uh, one or two uh, tips for your revision. The last uh, session I held, and then I give that, and I'm repeating it, that uh, you have less than one month or just about one month to do exams. And around this time, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, deception out there. People creating impression to you that maybe uh, they can predict questions or they have questions. Uh, please don't waste your time about that. Of course, my advice is that any question which comes your way, try and solve it. But don't let your preparation be restricted by you having a particular question. As I indicated in the last, the very last session, uh, that the best preparation is to go through all the C subjects. And I said that for each of the C subjects on your own, if you want to be sure that you have done the minimum expected to pass the exams on your own, uh, sit down, don't open any book, take a paper or a book, and then for each subject, you take Ghana legal system on your own, list all the subjects, sorry, list all the topics which are usually treated in Ghana legal system, which that you recall. Now, when you are done that, uh, under each of the topic you have listed, attempt to summarize the key points, right? The key points are not that on your own, without opening any book. And also just state the main authority, statutory provisions, and then the case law under that particular topic. Now you do that for all the topics in Ghana legal system. Then you repeat it for law of contract. You repeat it for constitutional law. You repeat it for criminal law. You repeat it for law of movable property or land law. And then you repeat it for uh, uh, what they call the law of thought. Now, if you heed this advice, uh, you will notice that you have a, a very good picture of where you stand in terms of uh, where you are strong and where you need to uh, go and pay a bit more attention to. And so that is a better way of preparing for this type of exams where you do not have control about the exact uh, topic or subject which you are going to be examining. All that you know is that there are six examinable subjects. Okay, so having said that, we would like to discuss uh, an aspect of a uh, law of thought tonight. Uh, I think, okay. Okay, so we want to discuss uh, the rule in Rollins and, uh, and, and Fletcher. But I think if you look at the law school entrance examination, there has been an occasion where, where there was a, I think a question uh, on this topic. I don't have uh, that particular question before me, but I think that uh, since they started the law school entrance examination, there has ever been a question like that. So uh, where you have a question, it may be either an essay or problem-based uh, question, and you notice that the rule in Rollins and Fletcher it has a very limited uh, understanding, but in the more recent years, you look at the UK Supreme Court or the House of Laws, in the Cambridge Water Company case, there have been 
uh, a bit more refinements of what we knew about the root in Rollins and Fletcher. Of course, uh, here in Ghana, uh, in, we have not made any, uh, should I say, qualification or any modification of the rule in Rollins and Fletcher. And that is to say that uh, if it's ever applicable in our legal system, it is that principle uh, developed and continuously refined uh, in the common law for that matter by the UK uh, Supreme Court, which will be the understanding of that principle in Ghana too. Insofar as there is no inconsistency between that and the constitution or any statutory law. Now, another point to note is that uh, as far as essay question is concerned, you could also be asked to, for example, compare the rule in Rollins and Fletcher with some other thoughts, right? For example, because if you look at the course of action, which can be funded on the rule in Rollins and Fletcher, uh, to some extent, you may say that it is similar to some other thoughts like the thought of negligence, uh, new science, especially private new science, and also trespass to land. So it is uh, important that uh, we understand these other thoughts so that we are in a position to be able to draw proper comparison between the rule in Rollins and Fletcher on one hand, and then the other thoughts such as negligence, private nuisance especially, and then trespass uh, to land. Now, as far as problem-based uh, question around the rule in Rollins and Fletcher uh, is concerned, uh, it may require you to differentiate uh, the rule in Rollins and Fletcher from other property-based thoughts, just like what I have uh, uh, indicated. So in that case, you have to find out a situation in which the defendant has taken something onto the land, which has escaped and caused harm, as that should trigger a consideration of Rollins and Fletcher. In other words, uh, you, you have to really be on the lookout uh, in terms of what the defendant has brought onto the land before you can even think of the applicability of the rule in Rollins and, and, and Fletcher. Uh, so let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. And then again, uh, as I've indicated, there is the, the, the significant overlap uh, with negligence, private nuisance, and then the trespass. So uh, it will be useful in your revision to also revise your understanding of negligence, private nuisance, and the trespass to land. So these are initial uh, remarks. Good. Uh, so we know the rule in Rollins and Fletcher emanated from a case uh, which we call Rollins and Fletcher, a 19th uh, century uh, old case. And uh, it was a case in which damage was caused by the escape of uh, water from a reservoir uh, that flooded uh, a mine. And the principle committed in the case, uh, as we know, uh, continue to be relevant to uh, certain areas in which other uh, types of uh, uh, thoughts, for example, could not uh, you know, support a claim and so on. If you look, various cases I uh, have commented on it and academic writers also continue to uh, critique it. Uh, so therefore, uh, let us look at the, what happened in the Rollins and Fletcher uh, SF 
uh, which has provided a basis for liability for harm caused by the escape of things brought onto the land. Now, if you look at the literature, uh, basically uh, what happened in Rollins and Flesher was that the defendant engaged independent contractors to construct a reservoir to supply water uh, to his mill. And this was uh, built over abandoned mine shafts, which collapsed due to the weight of the water, causing water to flood onto the plaintiff's uh, colliery. The defendant had not been negligent, according to what we know about the thought of negligence, okay? And there was no basis for a claim in private nuisance. You could not actually uh, bring a claim that uh, he had actually interfered with the enjoyment of your uh, uh, private uh, property as in your land. So there was no basis for claiming private uh, nuisance because the defendant are taking reasonable care to select a competent and experienced uh, independent contractor uh, as you look at the, uh, the facts. So uh, in the light of that situation, uh, the court was of the view that the defendant's liability was established on the basis that, quote, the person who for his own purposes, and I'm quoting the words of uh, Justice Blackburn, uh, whose words were given a blessing by the House of Law, eventually on appeal. Uh, so Justice Blackburn, among other things, said that the person who for his own purposes brings on his land and collects and keeps there anything likely to do mischief, if it escapes, must keep at his ferry, and if he does not do so, is prima facie answerable for all the damage, which is the natural consequences of its escape. Now this uh, beautiful uh, condition was actually uh, approved by the, the by the house uh, of laws eventually and uh, the house of laws uh, lord kens for example uh, emphasized that the required use of the land should be a non natural use before liability uh, which was recognized in this type of facts would actually be upheld so that that is a so if you look at like the original uh, rendition by uh, Blackburn, the non-natural use was actually uh, not there because uh, that is all that he said. And let me quote uh, Blackburn again. We think that the rule of law is that the person who, for his own purposes, brings on his land and collects and keeps there anything likely to do mischief if it escapes must keep it in at his peril. And if he does not do so, is prima facie answerable for all the damage, which is the natural consequences of its escape. So just to clarify uh, the meaning that what you have brought there uh, should be something which is a non-natural uh, use uh, as it were. So uh, one requirement is that you must collect and keep something, right? So as in the facts of uh, Rollins and Flesher, the defendant collected water on his land and kept it there in a reservoir. So collected water on his land and kept it there in his reservoir. And as you know, uh, the principle for this type of liability to be upheld requires that something should be brought onto the line by the defendant. So that is to say that, assuming you have like a program-based question, and if you cannot find any piece of information suggesting that 
a potential defendant brought something onto uh, the land, onto his land, which subsequently escaped, then you cannot be thinking of a course of action uh, based upon uh, the rule in Rollins and Fletcher. So liability cannot be established. If something uh, that occurs naturally on the land uh, escapes and causes some. In other words, if there is something which is uh, part of the, the natural use, right? The natural use of the land, if it should escape and cause us harm, you cannot bring a nation in on basis of the rule the balance and flesh. So let us keep uh, that in mind. And that is why uh, Lord Ken's uh, no addition of the phrase, uh, non-natural use is what is important. So the defendant must have brought something onto the land, which does not occur naturally on the land. And then of course, uh, it escaped. That is where we can begin to uh, ask ourselves as whether the rule in Rallance and Fraser, for example, is uh, activated. Yeah, so it is important that we remember that uh, the thing that is collected and kept on the land might be the thing that escaped, right? So in Rallance and Fraser, what was brought there? Water, right? It was brought onto the land and that water uh, escapes. But uh, that uh, this is not just the, the, the requirement for liability. The requirement for liability is that something which does not uh, occur uh, naturally uh, on the land. So that is uh, very uh, important. So it may also be that uh, the thing that is collected and kept on the land causes something else to escape. So not the thing which is collected and kept on the land escape itself, but let's say that it triggers something else to escape. Can that also engage the principle in Rollins and Fletcher? Okay, so if you look at cases like uh, Miles against the uh, forest rock granite, company, uh, explosives were collected and kept on the defendant's land in relation to his current business. But it was the rocks freed by the explosion that escaped from the land. So here, you notice that the thing which was collected itself did not uh, escape, but it triggered escape of some uh, other things. And then you also look at the LMS International against the starring packaging. There, the defendant's business involved cutting polystyrene blocks with hot wire. So the polystyrene was collected and kept on the premises, but it was fire caused by the hot wire that escaped. So the polystyrene itself did not escape, but the polystyrene gave rise to fire, and then the fire escaped. The fire spread to the plaintiff's land uh, as it will. Another important element we have to ask ourselves is that uh, was there a non-natural use of the land? And as a Lord Kens indicated in the Rollins uh, case. Uh, and what do you mean by uh, the non-natural uh, uh, use uh, of the land? Uh, non-natural uh, user or non-natural user, as uh, it were, is a, a very important uh, aspect. Uh, and in this, if you go back, like if you go back to even the cases of the Rollins, uh, it's about construction of the reservoir. So. Uh, certainly, the reservoir is not necessarily uh, uh, you know, a natural use of the land, uh, so to speak. And that was why 
in recast against the Lord, the, the Privy Council, for example, explained that uh, if water escaped from an uh, overflow pipe, that could not be described as a non-natural use of the land, as this required some special use, bringing with it increased danger to others. So not ordinary use of the land. In other words, it's not the normal, no, the usual use of the land, which is actually uh, contemplated as being a non-natural use, which would uh, trigger operation of the rule in uh, Rollins and Fresher. And the House of Laws uh, gave a better uh, uh, clarity uh, in read against the Lyons, where it was acknowledged that what may be regarded as dangerous or non-natural will vary according to circumstances, taking into account the circumstances of time and practice of mankind, unquote. So that is to say that there is a, a shifting meaning of that what you have brought onto the land, which may be considered as a, a non-natural uh, use, or if you like, like the dangerous. And the, 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 the House of Law is indicating that the particular time that you are dealing with and also the practice of mankind uh, at the time, they all determine whether something that you have brought onto the land, for example, uh, can be among, can, can amount to what we call like the, a non-natural user or a non-natural uh, user. So it's elastic. It, it means that uh, is, we are not really restricted to only those instances uh, in which a case law has said that this is uh, a non-natural use, but we have to look at it on the case by case uh, basis uh, as uh, it, it, it were. <clears throat> so therefore in Musgrove uh, against the Pandelis, uh, it was held that the storage of a car with petrol in this tank in a garage was a danger and therefore a uh, non-natural use of land. And the defendant was liable under the principle in Rollins and Fraser when the fuel ignited and fire spread to uh, neighboring properties. Maybe some people uh, may find it uh, uh, difficult uh, you know, probably today because it is not uh, uncommon. For example, now you have a garage even in your house. You keep a car there. Uh, you, you, if you look at the construction of houses and the cars being kept there, it's keeping the car in your garage and the fuel and everything. It's, 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 it's part of the ordinary use uh, of the land. So this reinforces the point which was made that what constitutes a non-natural use or dangerous thing actually varies from time uh, to time and according to the practice of mankind. So that if some years ago, uh, cars were, for example, not common or keeping cars uh, as part of your house, like not, these days we have like the garage and all that, if that was not common now, that is very much part of how we live. People build houses, they even have garage and so on and so forth. So if, for example, your car is there, and let's suppose that the car, there's a fault in it and probably uh, there is fire and so on, you may not be able to bring a successful claim under the rule in Rollins and Ward, Fletcher. But let's suppose that uh, some years ago, you have probably been successful. You have probably been uh, successful as happened in the mass group and panelists because according to time and according to the practice of mankind at the time, it was not really normal, for example, to be uh, keeping the car with your no fuel and so on 
and very close where other people uh, residences are as it were so the takeaway is that what constitutes no natural user or no natural use of land whilst whether something is dangerous is very much uh, dependent upon the particular time we are talking about and also according to the practice of uh, mankind at the time. So uh, let us keep that uh, in mind. <clears throat> and that was why uh, in Transco uh, against uh, Stockport, a 2004 uh, decision, uh, there was the escape of water from a pipe owned by the defendant uh, local authority and caused an embankment to collapse, uh, which exposed a gas pipe, necessitating expensive emergency remedial work by the plaintiff, claimant. So the claimant uh, sued the defendant uh, local authority and uh, the House of Laws uh, in it holding did not accept that this fell, that is the, excuse me, the embankment and this collapse did not accept that it fell within the scope of the, the, the rule in Rollins and Fletcher because the supply of water through the pipes, according to the court was normal and routine and not something that presented a particular hazard. So let's look at it. He said that it was normal and routine. That is according to the prices of mankind at the time. So the risk presented by any particular activity according to the court in a Transco case had to be considered by contemporary standards. So if you remember, uh, we just were just uh, what the, was uh, noted in the uh, read against the uh, Lyons, uh, that, uh, according to Lord uh, Porter, that uh, what amounts to non natural use or what considered as a dangerous thing or non natural user very much depends upon the, the circumstances the circumstances or the contemporary standards, that is the, the, the practice of humankind uh, at the time. And in that respect, uh, the court held that as the pipe carried no more risks of fracture, leading to the escape of water than any other pipe, it could not be considered a non-natural use of land. So here, uh, you see that the court was taking a very liberal view that yes, there was just a, a fracture in the in the pipe which carried the water. And yes, in if there's a fracture or crack in anything, there could be leakage and so on. And if uh, there was such a leakage and it contributed towards the collapse of the embankment, it does not afford you a successful course of action based upon the rule in reliance and law, uh, Flesher, because it could not be considered a non-natural use of the land. And as we know, for a successful case to be brought on basis of the, the rule in reliance and Flesher, the thing that you have you, you brought or collected on the land or kept there and, and which has escaped, it should be something uh, which would constitute a non-natural use, something which is not routinely part of that particular land. Yeah, and Lord Hoffman in the Transco uh, case made the point that damage to property caused by leaking water was a risk against which insurance was available. We supported the conclusion that this situation did not meet the high threshold of exceptional risk arising from non-natural use that is required if a claim under uh, Roland's emergency succeed. Now, you see that Lord Hoffman is adding another thing that, yes, if you look at the problem or the situation, there is insurance policy for that type of thing. And in his lordship view, 
that even made it not a candidate for some to be considered as a, a non-natural uh, user or non-natural user. And for that matter, the rule in Wallace and Fluencia would not actually uh, operate successfully. Another requirement is that uh, the thing which the defendant has collected or brought onto the land uh, should be likely to do mischief if it escapes. In other words, if it escapes, it should cause harm or should do uh, uh, mischief uh, as it were. And by this requirement, we mean that the thing collected and kept on the land by the defendant need not be dangerous in itself. So the thing you have brought need not necessarily be dangerous, provided that it is likely to cause harm if it escapes. Now, its potential or its ability to cause harm in the event of it leaving your control, leaving your custody and going to, let's say, the plaintiff's land or the neighboring uh, you know, property is what is important and not the thing being dangerous in itself. So this is uh, something we have to pay attention to because there's that temptation to think that, yes, what would trigger operation of the rule in Rollins and Fraser is that the thing that you have collected and kept on the land should be dangerous, not necessarily so. What is important is that should it escape from your control and go to your neighbor's land or adjoining land, is it likely to cause harm? If the answer is yes, then uh, this uh, aspect of the rule is satisfied. That is, it's likely to do mischief if it escapes. And that was why, if you look at the Rollins and Fletcher, the thing which was collected was water. Remember, the reservoir, it was just water. And water, ordinarily speaking, is not dangerous by itself. However, when it was contained in the reservoir <clears throat> and it escaped, then it becomes dangerous because it can flood. It can cause other disruption. But the water by itself, uh, it will uh, be argued is not dangerous. And of course, the, the, the facts of violence and pressure do not suggest that the water was, for example, contaminated or you no know, hardly poison in it per se. And for that matter, we just take it as a normal water. And that by itself is not dangerous. However, when it escaped, there was that uh, likelihood that uh, it could cause a mischief. So for example, if we look at the other cases, like the case of uh, Jones against the Festival Railway, for example, a passenger train emitted sparks, which set fire to the claimants or the plaintiff's uh, haystack. So here, uh, you notice that the train per se, right? The train, uh, train per se, uh, is not dangerous, or if you like the the sparks which come out from the train, not necessarily dangerous, but the fact that it was able to burn, right, the plaintiffs and haystack, that is uh, what made it satisfy the requirement that what you have brought onto the land uh, should likely do a mischief if it escaped, or. You similarly look at the case of the West against the Bristol uh, tramways. Uh, wood paving used by the defendant was coated in a uh, crosset, and the fumes from this damaged a neighbor's uh, plant and shrubs. So the simple thing to observe and the takeaway is that it's not so much about what you have collected what you have brought onto the land, you collected and keep. In this uh, being dangerous, but whether it is likely to do mischief, it's likely to cause uh, trouble, harm, uh, if it escapes, that is what is really uh, important. 
And that is why in the uh, interesting case of uh, Helia against Air Ministry, the Air Ministry laid electricity cables and uh, the Clemens film or the plaintiff's film. Many years later, 19 of the cows in the field were electrocuted. Simultaneously, when electricity escaped from the cables. So here, if we look at it, yes, of course, you use electricity, no doubt, uh, is dangerous. But for purposes of this rule, the electricity which had been uh, uh, laid under the plaintiff's field itself was not the, the danger which was really uh, needed for uh, operation of the rule in Rollins and Fletcher. But the fact that if you don't keep the power, right, the life power, if you don't keep it and it escapes, causing electrocution, as we saw in the Hillier case, uh, a number of volts of cows, that is where the, 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 the problem is. That is where the problem is. So just like, of course, otherwise uh, we can't even have life. You have electricity, for example, being carried uh, over your house, going to another in the house and so on. Uh, so that in itself is not a problem. But if, for example, the insulation and so on is, for example, compromised or is effective, and without the insulation, you know that whether is likely to cause a mischief. If it is, then the, a cause of action may probably be brought under the roof in Wallace and, and Flesher. Uh, so let us uh, uh, keep that uh, in mind. <clears throat> so uh, another requirement is that what you have brought onto the land escape and, uh, and causes uh, harm, as uh, we've just been uh, explaining. But there's the, the case of a crow host, which is interesting. Uh, yew trees were planted in the defendant's uh, cemetery, but the branches hung into a neighboring field and were eaten by the Kliman hosts, which died. Now, the trees, the yew trees, no, per se, could not be considered uh, uh, no, dangerous when it was there. But then, when it did not stay within the defendant's land and it grew and the branches projected uh, onto the plaintiff's land and then the horse ate it and it killed the horse. That was the, 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 the problem uh, as uh, it were. Another thing, uh, is that foreseeability. Uh, that is to say that uh, what you have brought onto the land when it you know, escapes, uh, causes harm, that needs to be addressed is whether the potential for the harm was foreseeable. In other words, the harm, which the thing you have brought and escaping going to you no know, cause. Was it foreseeable? Foreseeable means that could it have been anticipated? Could it have been uh, known ahead of time? The harm that the thing you have brought onto your land, which is non-natural user, which is going to escape and likely to cause a harm. That harm, uh, is it a harm which is foreseeable? No doubt, if you look at the Rollins and Fletcher principle, uh, the liability there is a straight uh, liability, isn't it? Because we mean that if something escaped from land and caused harm, the person who brought the thing that has escaped and causing harm, that's the defendant, will be liable. Even if this was not something that he could have predicted or guarded against. In other words, uh, if you go back to the Rollins and Fletcher, the logic would be that so long as you have brought something which is no natural user, and then you have not be able to cut it, and then it has escaped and causing harm. Even if the harm that it has caused, it is said that 
you could not have even stated it or imagined it ahead of time, you are still uh, liable. Now, this uh, aspect of the, you know, the, the this, uh, this kind of thought based upon the Rollins and Fleischer uh, was given uh, some examination by the UK IPS court uh, in the Cambridge uh, water case. That the Cambridge water against uh, Eastern uh, counties ladder. Uh, about two uh, so uh, decades uh, ago. And that case actually engaged the issues of uh, the non-natural use of the ability of the damage. What happened in Cambridge water against Eastern counties? The defendant company was a leather manufacturer who used chemical solvents in the tanning uh, process. Uh, these chemicals were stored in drums on the defendant's premises. We had a uh, you know, new regulation issued by the European uh, Commission as part of the EU law. So test one to that, tests were carried out on the plaintiff's uh, water and it was found to be polluted by chemicals from the tannery as pillages are leak into the water. So when a suit was brought in the trial court, uh, the claim based on relance and pleasure was dismissed on the basis that there was not a non-natural use of land due to the amount of time that the tannery had been in operation and the industrial area in which it was located. So the trial court was looking at the fact that this tannery has been here for many years. And the place is also designated as what? As an industrial area. So it is difficult for us to uh, treat the tannery, for example, as a, a non-natural user. Now, when the matter went on appeal, the court of appeal rejected the argument made at the trial court and rather came to the conclusion that the storage of chemicals was a non-natural use of land and found the defendant liable for damage caused on straight liability basis. Now, if you look at it, the court of appeal was of the view that yes, it does not matter that the defendant could not have foreseen that the, 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 the chemicals, right? The, the chemicals which have been uh, stored as part of the uh, tannery could, for example, leak and seep into the ground and then into the water and all that. So long as the chemicals are considered as being a non-natural user, not part of like the, the, you know, the routine uh, you know, user of the land, it did not matter that the harm uh, could not be foreseen, uh, they were still uh, liable. Now this eventually uh, made its way from the court of appeal to the house of laws. And then in the house of laws, uh, the house of laws uh, held uh, speaking through uh, Lord uh, Goff, uh, who examined the precise wording of the original formulation of the rule in Rollins and Fletcher by Justice, Justice Blackburn. Uh, don't forget Justice Blackburn did the original formulation of the rule, which was given blessing by the, the House of Lords. So Lord Goff in the Cambridge Water went back to the original formulation of the principle by Blackburn and identify phrases such as, quote, anything likely to do mischief if it escapes, something he knows to be mischievous and liability for natural and anticipated uh, consequences. And he used these you know, phrases from Blackburn's formulation to say that uh, the rule in Rollins and Fraser replied at least foreseeability of the risk 
as a prerequisite for recovery of damages. In other words, you know, until Cambridge Water Company case, balance and pleasure had just been understood as you know a strict liability. So long as you brought something onto the land, you have not kept, and the thing is a non-natural user is likely to escape. He has actually escaped, and he has caused harm. It did not matter that you could not uh, previously, before it, it happened, have even imagined or anticipated uh, you know, the type of harm or damage which would be caused. You were still liable. But in the Cambridge water, uh, Lord Goff, who wrote one of the leading opinion uh, seem to be suggesting that there was a need for foreseeability of risk as a condition for recovering compensation on basis of uh, the rule in Rawlins and Fletcher. And Lord Goff went on to say that uh, the thought was straight liability only in the sense that the defendant will be liable for the consequences of escape, even if you are taking steps to prevent it occurring. And he made reference to, if you remember, uh, the wagon mall number one in the thought of a negligence. And uh, you know, where the, the, the principle of foreseeability was discussed and concluded that Roland and Fletcher require foreseeability by the defendant of the relevant type of damage. So that is, you know, in, in that case, the claiming compensation for you know, damages on basis of the ruin relevance and pleasure you know, is brought closer to uh, when you're also seeking damages for uh, you know, negligence. You know, when you have established that there has been like a breach of duty of care and then the resultant injury and so on. So that is the, the twist which Cambridge Water against the Eastern counties uh, seem to have added to the principle in the Rawlands and, and, and Fletcher. So applying uh, the principle, therefore, uh, as the defendant in the Cambridge Water case had not foreseen that chemicals will seep through the floor and contaminate water supply, there could be no liability under Rawlands and Fletcher. So here, you see that the House of Laws have actually uh, varied the decision uh, which the, the lower courts actually came to and emphasized that the, 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 the contamination supposedly emanating from the water which have uh, leaked from the tannery according to the worship was not something foreseeable, was not something that would have been uh, anticipated or could have been imagined as being uh, a likely uh, consequence that matter uh, the claim was not maintainable. So let us pay attention to this. Now, where you have actually established that the elements of violence and pleasure are present, the next thing we should ask ourselves is that, are there any defenses, right? Are there any defenses? And this is especially so if you have like a problem-based question, uh, which require maybe a consideration of a cause of action of violence and pleasure, you need to uh, find out, yes, having established the elements of violence and pleasure according to the facts of this case, can we also say that the defendant has got some defenses, in which case he can escape liability or he can reduce his liability? Well, the defenses include contributory uh, negligence, right? Uh, contributory negligence. That is to say that if the claimant or the plaintiff was partly to blame for damage to his property, that is the plaintiff's behavior uh, also contributed to the damage, uh, which the escape you know, of the chain, which the defendant brought onto the land as for example, cause and so on. Uh, that would also be a defense. That is to say that uh, by failing to take proper precaution against the sort of harm which occurred, uh, any 
compensation, which may be uh, permitted or how to reduce to reflect this. So if maybe there was some precautions that uh, the, 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 I mean the plaintiff, you know, we have taken in order to minimize the exposure to the harm step of that from the defendant premises. Well. And he didn't do that, then it will reduce the cost or the amount of compensation that may be switched to the given. Another possible defense is that uh, consent. Right? So if the plaintiff or the claimant expressly or impliedly consented to the collecting and keeping of the thing, that escape. We cannot then hold the defendant liable for the consequences of, uh, of the escape. Maybe let's think of an uh, example. Uh, let's oh, please uh, mute yourself. Uh, I think somebody, please mute yourself. Thank you. And some of you, they don't know how to meet, so let me meet everyone. Yeah, so as you know, uh, as they say that you cannot uh, appropriate and what? And reprobate. You cannot uh, consent to something and still complain about it. And this consent may be direct or indirect. So if the uh, defendant has collected and kept something which is considered a non-natural user with your approval and should it, for example, escape and cause uh, harm uh, to you, uh, you cannot actually uh, complain against the defendant because you consented. Another defense is the act of God. Uh, act of God, of course, uh, Majer. And here we are talking about unforeseeable natural circumstances that cause the escape, right? So maybe, yes, you brought something onto your premises, you've kept, but let's say that the heavy flooding or any other thing, like maybe you look at the uh, Rollins and the Fletcher, for example. Uh, if it was flooding, right, which caused the reservoir, let's suppose that it was not any breakage or any defects in the reservoir, which caused the water to leak. And let's suppose that there had been heavy flooding and then the flooding had uh, cause the water to leak, causing damage and all that. Uh, there could have been a legitimate argument that the, the damage or the harm caused was caused by an act of God. Maybe let's say Ghana, for example, if you take the, the, the bagger uh, dam, right? Every year, or uh, you know, the bagger dam from the, the Burkina area, when maybe when it, it, it rained heavily and so on, uh, it's caused flooding. Now, where the dam had not been open, let's say deliberately, and uh, it is rain, which has caused that, it may be difficult for us to contemplate a cause of action based upon the rain water and water. Because in that case, the heavy flooding could be uh, considered as an uh, out of God, which is a legitimate uh, defense. And another, another uh, defense is also uh, acts of a stranger. And what do you mean by this? That is to say that if an unknown third party takes action, which leads to uh, escape. Yes, let's say that the defendant has brought something which is a non-natural user on his premises. But the, the thing escape 
not as a result of the action or inaction of the defendant, but let's say that like a third party, right? A third party, for example, causes the thing to escape, then uh, that cannot be uh, blamed on the defendant. For example, look at the records against the Lodian, where the flood was caused by a third party, blocking the outlet and turning on the, the taps. Uh, the defendant will be able to escape uh, liability. And finally, and a very important defense, that is a statutory authority or statutory justification. Uh, that is to say that where the defendant did what he did as a result of lawful permission or license, right? So let's take Ghana, for example. We have the Environmental Protection Authority or the EPA. You want to do development. You go through EIA, Environmental Impact Assessments, and you are given environmental permits. Now, where maybe there is a, an escape, maybe along the lands, uh, which we know under the rule in reliance and pleasure, and then it causes uh, damage or harm, you could uh, put up the statutory authority or the statutory justification defense to any uh, action. Because the fact that you went through the environmental impact assessment and you have been given the environmental permit, it is an acknowledgement or endorsement that what you are going to do, for example, does not have any significant uh, harm or hazard. And should anything happen, you should be able to uh, invoke uh, that uh, defense. Now, just before we go, let us look at how the rule in Rollins and Fletcher, for example, compare with other thoughts. Because if you look at the you know, thought of negligence, private nuisance, and trespass to land, you can see you know, some closeness or some similarity. And for that matter, some people even argue that the rule or the thought in Rollins and Fletcher does not play any useful role in modern uh, thought law. Because what the rule in Rollins and Fletcher take care of uh, is taken care of by some other thoughts. Is that really the case? Is it true that the rule in Rollins and Fletcher is no longer necessary because what it seeks to protect is already taken care of by some other thoughts? For example, if you look at the Australian uh, High Court decision, an Australian High Court is not just a High Court, it's the Supreme Court of Australia, that's how they call it. So equivalent to like the UK uh, Supreme Court or Ghana Supreme Court. So the Australian High Court, for example, in the case of a uh, Bernie Port Authority against the General uh, uh, Jones, stated that relevance and pleasure should be considered as subsumed within the law of negligence. That is to say that they are now uh, putting Rollins and Fletcher on more or less the same pedestal as thought of negligence. And if we look at the, even the UK decision, the Cambridge Water case you look at, if you read the full judgment, Lord Goff also you know, in his uh, dicta dropped a hint that Rollins and Fletcher is a species of private negligence. Of course, that is uh, quite uh, not straightforward. But the point uh, being made is that there has been a concern as to whether Rollins and Fletcher is even uh, you know, a relevant thought on its own. Well, I will propose that you revise negligence, private nuisance, and then the 
trespass to land so that you'll be able to do proper comparison with the thought based on the rule in Rawlins and what uh, Flesher. And maybe we'll attempt to look at uh, some of these comparisons. So we are trying to compare Rawlins and Fletcher with negligence, private nuisance, and trespass to land. So we want to ask the question, who can sue or who can claim? In Rawlins and Fletcher, it is a person whose land or property is harmed by the escape of a dangerous thing, by the escape of a non-natural user who can uh, claim or who can sue. But in the case of negligence, the one who can sue is a person who has suffered personal harm or who has had harm to his property as a result of a breach of duty of care by another person. On the other hand, if you are talking about private nuisance, the person who can sue is a person with a proprietary interest in the land who has suffered interference with the quiet enjoyment of the land. And uh, if you take trespass to land, the one who can sue is a person in possession of the land who has suffered unjustified and direct interference with that land. So here you begin to see the relationship. You begin to see the, the, the relationship in terms of even who can claim. That's why the fact that there appears to be you know, similarity, you can also see some differences. We can certainly see some uh, differences. Now, in terms of liability, who is liable? Who can be blamed, right? Who can be a defendant? With respect to a thought based upon Rollins and Flesher, the defendant or the person who is liable is the person responsible for the land from which the dangerous thing escaped. So there's the, the, no, the, the dangerous, the, the escape of the dangerous thing did not come from the air. It came from a certain land. And that is a requirement for operationalization of the rule in Rollins and Flesher. So who, the person in charge of the land from where the dangerous thing escaped is the one who can be the defendant, who can be sued under the thought in Rollins and Flesher. But if you are talking about the thought of negligence, the person who is liable or who can be sued is the person whose breach of duty of care caused the injury or harm. So the person who owed another person duty of care and whose conduct or omission breached their duty of care, which resulted in the harm or the injury which the plaintiff is complaining of. It is that person who can be sued or who can be held uh, liable. But if you also look at private nuisance, who is the potential defender who, or who is liable? It is a person in control of land from which the nuisance emanates. And that is why uh, Lord Dwarf in Cambridge, uh, Lord Water will probably say that uh, Rallance and Fletcher is a species of uh, a private nuisance. Because if you look at it, in terms of the one who can be sued or who is liable, with respect to private nuisance, the person in control of the land from which the nuisance emanates, he can be held liable. Now, if you also talk about the, the rule and violence and pleasure, the person in charge of the land from which the dangerous sin escaped is the one who is to be held liable. And with respect to trespass to land, who is liable? The person who interferes with the land affected by the trespass. So the person actually, you know, I thought that, so that one is very uh, straightforward. Somebody's land is there. You, the person uh, you know, causing the trespass, you are the one who can be held liable. Now, let's look at the type of uh, interference at stake in, in, in each of these thoughts, these four thoughts we are talking about. In the case of Rollins and Fletcher, the interference at stake we are talking about direct or indirect harm caused to the land or property on the land. So that is the kind of interference that we are talking about. So the dangerous, you know, the escape of the dangerous thing directly harms uh, another person's land or a property on that person's land. Then we take negligence, the type of interference we are talking about 
any damage to the property or personal injury caused by the breach of the duty. And then private uh, nuisance, indirect harm in terms of interference with quiet enjoyment of land. So you see that uh, private nuisance and the rule in Rwanda's and Fletcher, it has very uh, close relationship. And that is why some would even say that uh, uh, Rwandans and Fletcher should be seen now as just an aspect of a private uh, nuisance as it were. And if you talk about the trespass to land, the type of interference is any direct intrusion onto the land by a person or property. Now that is not necessarily the same as Rawlings and Fletcher because if we look at the requirement of the, the course of action based on Rawlings and Fletcher as the, we saw in the Cambridge water uh, case, the need for that you know, foreseeability of harm and so on, it's not just escape of uh, the dangerous lotion. It must cause harm. That is a requirement. So that if the thing has escaped from the defendant premises, but it doesn't cause harm, or it's not likely to cause harm, you will not have actually brought to yourself properly within the remits or the requirements of the course of action based on the rule in balance and pleasure. And for that matter, uh, is there a need for harm or fault in any of these uh, thoughts? Well, if we take reliance and pleasure, uh, traditionally, it was seen as straight liability. Just recently, maybe in 1994, when the Cambridge Water uh, case came up before the, the then UK House of Laws, now replaced by the UK Supreme Court, where some of the law laws, you know, Lord Gough and the rest, will add another layer that if you go back to the original reading of Blackburn's formulation of the principle uh, you know, of the thought of action you call the Rollins and Blazer, in the Rollins and Blazer case, according to Lord Gough, there is indication that. Uh, there's a requirement for some uh, foreseeability. Other than that, one will have argued that there is no need for harm or there's no need for fault as far as a cause of action based upon violence and pleasure is concerned. But now, uh, the other thing to also notice that as I said, there's a, a requirement for harm to property. So that if there's no harm to property or to the, to the plaintiff's land, then uh, you have not established a requirement. But when you talk about like negligence, uh, negligence requires breach of duty of care and foresight of consequences, right? So uh, negligence, you cannot be liable or guilty of negligence where there's no breach of duty of care, where there is no consequent injury, uh, which was uh, foreseeable. And it covers harm to person and property. Even now, it also even covers uh, what you call like the financial uh, loss, uh, as it were. Then if you want to talk about a uh, private uh, nuisance, private nuisance requires a reasonable use of land. And that resembles a false requirement. So, in private nuisance, there's a need for, uh, there, there's a comment for harm because you're talking about interference with someone's uh, quiet enjoyment. So that is the, the, the harm in that. But with respect to trespass to land, the interference must be intentional. And of course, that is consistent with our understanding of uh, trespass, right? I know uh, trespass as a thought in general is intentional thought. So there's a need for, uh, intentional interference. So it's an actionable per se, meaning that there's no need for proof of damage. It's an actionable per se. So let us uh, uh, keep these things uh, in our mind as we revise the thought of uh, negligence based upon uh, the rule in the violence and, and, and flesh. And as I have uh, indicated we 
Well, no one knows whether there'll be question or there'll be no uh, question. And for that matter, what is important is that we have understanding of everything so that whatever comes, we're able to handle it. But in terms of conclusion, as far as the comprising of the rule in Rollins and Fletcher with the other three thoughts are concerned, uh, it may be uh, argued that uh, the thought in Rollins and Fletcher covers a rather uh, narrow uh, instances of conduct that is not covered by the other thoughts. And if you even, if you're having to take account, right, if the addition of foreseeability requirement in the, the Cambridge water case as decided by the UK House of Laws is anything to go by, then one will even argue that uh, the, the thought of action, I mean, I mean, the course of action based upon uh, Rollins and Fletcher more or less uh, has actually dissipated into thin air because it's come uh, very close to other uh, existing uh, thoughts. In a sense, therefore, uh, Rollins and Fletcher imposes liability for harm caused by something emanating from the defendant's land that was brought onto that land by the defendant and which had the potential to cause harm if it escaped. It is just the case of uh, Cambridge water, which as I have just uh, indicated, has added that the risk of escape and damage must have been uh, foreseeable. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, where we will end the revision of the thought of action based upon the rule in Wellands and Fletcher. But there are, I did three interesting uh, Ghanaian cases, but they don't actually add anything in terms of uh, development of the, uh, the principle, but just to let you have like a, a local uh, flavor, I think that we can just uh, talk about some of them. The case of uh, Atra against Abua. Atra against Abua decided in, I mean, reported in 1963, uh, two Ghana law reports, page 340. Uh, that uh, was in relation to liability for fire. The defendant in Atra against Abua in exceptionally dry and windy weather set fire to his farm. The fire was spread by the force of a strong wind in the plaintiff's cocoa, which was contiguous, that is that's very close to the defendant's uh, harm. So in a suit brought against the defendant before the circuit court, the plaintiff claimed that the defendant was negligent in setting fire to his own farm in these circumstances and in failing to prevent a spread to the plaintiff's farm. Now the circuit court judge found as a fact that before setting the fire, the defendant had cleared the edges of his farm and held that and held that to be the known and accepted the farming uh, practice at, at the time. And for that matter, he ruled that the burning of the plaintiff's farm was an act of God. And therefore the defendant was not liable to the plaintiff. Now the plaintiff was not satisfied with the decision of the circuit court. So he appealed the matter uh, in the high court. And the high court, uh, allowed appeal, that is to say that the High Court presided over by Justice Apalu disagree with the decision of the Circuit Court in the Atra and Abua, and rather uh, held uh, as follows, uh, from the head note one, that where the weather was known to be exceptionally drier and windy, and a man took the risk of lightening a fire, which then spreads in the ordinary course of nature and causes damage. Such damage 
cannot be said to have been caused by an act of God. So here, you see how the act of God defense, which we made, for example, is being uh, uh, know, disallowed because it's not being used uh, properly. Dry season or hamatan and so on, you know that it's very dangerous and fire can easily spread. You go and you know, set fire and it spreads to destroy another person's property. Then you say that because there was a wind, the, the wind is the one which caused it, and that's the act of God. So that's the Palu in the high court did not agree with that kind of reason. But well, if you look at the case, the case was actually not necessarily pleaded as a, a case funded on uh, the rule in the Rollins and, and Flesher, but the fact that there was an attempt to use the act of God uh, defense, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, interesting for our purpose. Because as far as the rule in Rollins and Flesher is concerned, if you look at the case itself, the judgment of uh, Apaluk and all that, that was not uh, what actually uh, granted the, 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 the decision in that particular case. But we also have like, the case of a Dublin against Ghana Housing Corporation, uh, reported in 1975 to Ghana Law Report, page 337. Dublin against uh, Ghana Housing Corporation. The plaintiff and the defendant corporation occupy land situated in a low lowering area, surrounded by hills. After heavy rain, water rushed down from the surrounding hills. And the defendant corporation therefore constructed gutters on its housing estate to divert the course of the water and prevent flooding. Some of the gutters were connected to the natural water course on the land which passed about 80 feet away from the plaintiff's house, which was on low, lower lying land. The plaintiff are taking no precaution against flooding by building her house with raised foundation. As the ground of her house was frequently flooded and the tenants moved out, she sued the corporation for damages for trespass. And the trial judge dismissed it because the trial judge was of the view that the plaintiff failed to tender her title to the land. In other words, the, the trial judge looked at the owner so that the plaintiff had not proved that uh, she was like the owner of the land. And eventually, the case was amended and they included aspect of uh, the rule in Rollins and Flesher. So when it came before the, the high court on appeal, it was held that the plaintiff could not sustain a claim either under the strict liability rule in Rollins and Flesher or under the less strict rule in any other case because there was no evidence that there was ever any accumulation or water anywhere on the plaintiff's property at any time. And according to the court, the evidence rather showed that the defendant corporation took reasonable and effective steps to prevent the expected flood, which was common threat to all landowners in the area. Yeah, so here uh, you see that uh, the court was trying to demonstrate that uh, some of the basic uh, requirements which are needed for operation of the rule in Rollins and Fletcher was even not applicable. So if you look at that is uh, Bedu's uh, decision, is that just a, a, a paragraph uh, in which uh, he considered the rule in Rollins and Fletcher because if you look at the original case, the lawyers did not include it in how they presented the case, but it even did not even avail the, the plaintiff as it were. 
Okay, so I'll take uh, some questions. Okay. okay, somebody said, can you write the Ghanaian cases in the chat box? Okay, let me do that. Yeah, so just before I draw the curtain down, any question? Any question? But see, let me give this advice that if you have a, a problem-based question, uh, unless the question has, the question tax master has actually you know, directed that uh, advise the parties whether maybe a course of action can be funded on the principle in Rollins and Fletcher. If you have just ordinary narration, right, of facts, and all that you do just advise the parties. Even if you can see elements of Rollins and Fletcher, for purposes of the Ghana School of Law and Trends examination, the strategy I will recommend is that don't uh, base you are solution to the problem only on the a cost of action based upon ruin, violence, and pleasure. You do uh, well if you should, for example, also consider whether some other thoughts, right? Some other thoughts can also be made uh, out based upon the set of facts that you have. And I'm giving this advice so that uh, assuming you know, your marking scheme, the focus is not so much on the you know, advising the parties according to whether a thoughts based upon Rollins and Fletcher apply and so on, you don't lose out. A third where is an essay question, in which case, as a question, you are directed uh, you know, specifically on what to do, but it is a, a problem-based question. And based upon the comparisons that you did, you notice that uh, you know, the a thought based upon the rule in Rollins and Fletcher is very much close to so many other thoughts, including a private nuisance and even in some respects, uh, some aspect of uh, negligence. So no, uh, you know how to pitch your response as whether you are dealing with a problem-based question or you are dealing with an essay question. Uh, somebody is asking me a question about what we did yesterday on criminal procedure in Ghana. Now, should you do the presentation as we did without any judicial cases? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, what we did, the overview of the criminal procedure is that's a topic in Ghana legal system. It's not the Ghana School of Law subject called criminal procedure, right? Which is the professional legal education. So know the level. It's still part of Ghana legal system. And for that matter, uh, what is expected of you at that level it's just a basic appreciation. It's different if, for example, you have learned criminal procedure as a subject in its own right, as you do when you go to the Ghana School of Law. So Mr. Che, uh, that is uh, what I would say. Any other before I end? Okay, uh, then have a good night.